This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. This week's case is going to talk about abduction, and most of the information in the case we're covering came from a Netflix documentary titled Abducted in Plain Sight. If you've seen it, you know immediately what I'm talking about. If not, I encourage you to watch it after you listen to this, because this case is going to sound very unbelievable, but you can hear it directly from those involved if you watch the documentary. Now, this case does talk about child sex abuse, and it may not be suitable for everyone, but it's also a case about being aware that this happens to many children, and it's not usually that creepy-looking stranger. As Jen mentioned, this case is absolutely incredible, probably one of the strangest ones I've ever seen, but let's get to it. The case this week is going to take us to Pocatello, Idaho. Pocatello is the largest city in Bannock County and the fifth largest city in the entire state of Idaho. It has a population of 54,000 and is home to Idaho State University. Over 55% of the residents have a religious affiliation with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so they are Mormon or LDS church members. This case is going to deal with one such family. So we refer to their church or religious affiliation as LDS, and LDS is going to play a role in this case. So a little background on LDS. It was started by Joseph Smith in New York during the 1820s. It is a heavily family-oriented religion with a strong sense of community and church. It has a strict law of chastity, and sexual intercourse outside of marriage is strictly forbidden. And all of these traits are going to be very important to this case. So back to Pocatello, Idaho, and our two families involved in this case this week. And the first family is the Broberg family, and they live in Pocatello. The Broberg family is comprised of Robert and Marianne. Robert goes by Bob. And they had three daughters, Jan, Susan, and Karen. Robert was a florist and owned a florist business in Pocatello. The other family in this case, the Berktold family, also lived in Pocatello, Idaho. And that was Robert and Gail Berktold, so we're dealing with two Roberts here. He also went by Bob. Bob Berktold owned a furniture store, and Bob and Gail had five children. And these families came into contact with each other when Mary Ann Broberg met the Berktold family when they were new at the LDS church there in 1972. Both families became very close. The parents were friends with each other. All of the children were close in age, so they all became friends as well. It's kind of like everybody in the family had a friend in the other family, you know. They referred to Bob Berktold as B, but for this podcast, we'll call him by his last name, Berktold, so that we don't confuse it, since we got so many Bobs. We got Bob Broberg, Bob Berktold, and me, B. And believe me, when you hear about this, I don't want to be confused at all. But they did refer to Bob Berktold as B. So let's get into the case. Berktold was considered the fun dad of the two families, and he was always doing activities with the kids. He would interact with them and play with them, do games and stuff. Bob and Marianne began to realize that Berktold seemed to like Jan, their oldest daughter, the best. He gave her more attention and a little bit of special attention, and he even had his own nickname for her, Dolly. Berktold would invite Jan on trips and outings with his family, and she would go along. Jan said she felt as if Berktold was her second father. I mean, she loved him and she trusted him. The case doesn't begin here, but this is the significant event in it. On Thursday, October 17th, 1974. Berktold called Mary Ann and asked if he could take Jan horseback riding. 
And Marianne said, hey, it's a school night. Let's try to pick another day. But Jan begged and begged. She wanted to go horseback riding with Berktold. So Marianne agreed that Berktold could pick her up after her piano lesson and take her horseback riding. But she needed to be home in time for dinner when her dad, Bob, got home. Bob got home, dinner came and went, and Jan didn't make it home. And at this time, Jan wasn't old enough to be out at night really by herself. She was only 12 years old. Marianne and Bob were obviously worried, and they thought maybe the car broke down or something had happened to Berktold and Jan. So they talked to Gail Berktold, and she comes to their home later that night, and that was around 9 p.m. They had a conversation. Gail had not heard from her husband, and they had not heard from Jan. So Mary Ann makes the suggestion that they call the police. But Gail said, no, I'm sure that we'll hear from them. I mean, it's probably something simple. And they agreed not to call the police and wait to hear from them. Two days go by. Nobody's heard from Jan or Berthold. This is when Jan's parents decided to call law enforcement. Marianne said they waited because they had been in contact with Gail and they just didn't want to upset her. And this was Saturday morning when Marianne made the call to the FBI. But she got the message that the office was closed for the weekend and it directed her to call another office in Butte, Montana for an emergency. But Marianne didn't do that. She says she just didn't want to get everybody all upset and create this big deal when she's sure it really wasn't anything major. So after five days of their 12-year-old being gone with Berktold, they finally got in touch with the FBI and Agent Pete Welsh went to the home of Bob and Marianne. Bob and Marianne did not feel like it was anything nefarious on the part of Burke told, but, you know, they needed to tell somebody because their 12-year-old is missing. A few days later, Burke told's car was found in Power County, and it had been abandoned. The keys were in the vehicle, the driver's side window was broken out, and there was blood on the exterior of the driver's door. The police saw that there were tire tracks near the car that didn't belong to the car, and one set of footprints. They talked to Gail. They're trying to figure out, hey, I mean, what could have possibly happened to your husband and this little girl? She tells them, well, we have a motor home, but it's in a storage facility. The FBI go to the storage facility, and as you guessed, that motor home is gone. The FBI theorizes that those tire tracks at the scene went to the motorhome. They think that Berktold had staged this car to look like something happened to him and Jan, but what actually happened is he had carried Jan from the car to the motorhome, which means there would only be one set of footprints, and he had kidnapped Jan. The FBI puts out a APB or a BOLO. This is an all points bulletin at the time is what it was called. Now it's more commonly called a BOLO or be on the lookout. And these were the days obviously before an Amber Alert. So all they can do is alert other police agencies of this motorhome and a kidnapping. Bob and Mary Ann tell the FBI they didn't think Jan was kidnapped because they trust Berktold. The FBI says they had to convince the parents, your daughter has been kidnapped. They investigate to see what they can find or where they can locate Jan and Burke told, but there were no clues to where they might be other than in this motorhome. The FBI starts to talk to people in the community, and it seems that Burke told really liked young girls. Berktold's own brother, Joe, says in this Netflix documentary that he knew his brother was a pedophile and a sexual pervert and always liked young girls. Joe reveals that when Berktold was about 12, he molested their younger sister who was only six. The FBI discovers that Berktold had attempted to get 
close to two other young girls in the community, but the parents realized what was going on and they put a stop to it. One other unusual thing is that Jan had shared a bedroom with her sister, and it was a very big bedroom. And Birch told said, hey, don't, don't y'all want to have your own rooms? And, of course, these girls did. So he built a wall to make two separate bedrooms. And, in effect, what he was doing was isolating Jan from everybody else in order to have more access to her without people being around. And if you think this is starting to get a little creepy, well, we're just warming up. Now the FBI believes that Berktold has kidnapped Jan in the motorhome, but they don't really have any clues on their location. They just have a theory, and their theory is coming together based on what Joe, the brothers, told them and what they find out from other people in the area. But they have no rock-solid clues. But 35 days into the kidnapping, which would put us on November 20th, 1974, the FBI catches a break. Berktold reaches out to his brother, Joe. He called Joe because he wanted Joe to place a call to Mary Ann, which is Jan's mom again, and get written permission for Berktold and Jan to come back to the United States and be legally married. He said that they had gotten married in Mexico because the legal age to marry in Mexico is 12, but that would not be recognized in the U.S. So the FBI verifies that story, and it is, in fact, legal for someone to get married in Mexico at the age of 12, and they do find out that this actually had happened. Joe calls Mary Ann, and she tells him that under no circumstances would they agree to this. Joe explains to Marianne that if she didn't agree that Berktold and Jan would not come back to the U.S. because Berktold would be a, either a dead man or have to spend the rest of his life in prison. Marianne and Bob would not agree to this. I mean, obviously, they are not going to give this guy permission to marry their daughter that he's abducted. So Joe places a call to the FBI. And the FBI comes in and they tap Joe's phone waiting on Burke told the to call. And they were able to trace those calls to Mazalan, Mexico. The FBI coordinates with Mexican law enforcement authorities and they locate the motorhome. And the Mexican law enforcement authorities actually raid the motorhome itself and rescue Jan from Burke told. So the Mexican authorities have have rescued Jan and now Berktold's in custody. And Jan doesn't say a whole lot right then about what happened. I mean, how we got to where we are. Now, later in life, she would kind of fill in the backstory. And she said that once Berktold picked her up, he had her take allergy pills before they made it to the stables. And so she did. And he told her that that was basically to avoid allergies, plants, and that kind of thing. But Jan said whatever she took put her to sleep almost instantly because she didn't remember any of the car ride. When she woke up, it was dark, but she could tell she was moving in some type of vehicle. She was laying on a bed with her wrists and ankles bound and strapped down. And she said that the pills had her kind of in and out of consciousness. But when she finally came to, her restraints were removed and she began to hear this weird voice coming from a white box next to her head. And she describes the voice as a strange, robotic, monotone voice that made her feel like she had been kidnapped by a UFO. you got to remember, she's 12, and during the mid-70s, science fiction was very popular. So movies and books about aliens and alien abductions were very, very common. And that's right where her 12-year-old mind went. The voice in the box told her that they were aliens from another planet and their names were Zeta and Zethra. The aliens told her that she, meaning Jan, was half human and half alien. They told her that her mother was human, but her real father was an alien. They also told her that now time had come for her to complete a mission for the alien planet in order to save the inhabitants of the alien planet. Well, let me say right here, I know this is getting really out there, but it is important 
And you got to remember, we're dealing with a 12 year old here. The mission that is being recounted to her through the box by Zeta and Zethra, just so we're all on the same page. The mission was for her to have a child with a male companion that she would soon meet. And she needed to do this by the time she was 16. The aliens told her if she didn't complete the mission that they had a backup plan. And the backup plan was that her sister Susan, who was also half alien, would have to complete the mission where she failed. She was told by the aliens to go to the front of the motorhome and there she would meet her male companion. This 12-year-old, Jan, did as she was told and when she went to the front, there was Burke told. She said that he was covered in blood, his eyes were, were closed, he wasn't moving, and he looked dead. Jan shook him until he became conscious. She said she was terrified but felt some relief when he started to stir because Berktold was there with her and she trusted him. Berktold began to tell her what happened, how they got to where they are, and he said they were going horseback riding when all of a sudden he saw a bright white light and he thinks that they were abducted by aliens. Jan then informs Burke told that she has been given this mission by Zeta and Zethra to accomplish. And Jan had fully bought into this alien mission. Remember, this was just a minute or two after hearing this mission. And like I've said several times, she's 12. It's worth noting that at the time, Burke told was somewhere in the neighborhood of 40. Jan recounted later in life that she felt like she spent a good bit of the time in the motorhome drugged. So Burke told is, is engaged in this charade and he begins to rummage around in the motorhome, I guess, looking for something to help them escape or whatever. And lo and behold, he finds some books and these books were all about sex. Jan and Burke told sit down and read these books together. Sometime after looking through the books, the white box with the alien voices told her it was time for her to ask the male companion to do what makes people happy. Jan, believing that this is an, a message from aliens to carry out this mission, complied and asked this of Burke told, and that's when the sexual assaults began. She said it was not violent or aggressive and that he never fully penetrated her, but would insert an inch of his penis into her vagina. Jan remembers having to focus on something else in order to get through this. And she even mentions in the show looking out the vents in the top of the motor home. Like B said, that's what Jan remembers and tells later in life. Let's go back to the rescue and what she told then. So Bert's told's arrested, Jan's rescued, and they're both taken to a Mexican jail. At one point, a guard takes Jan into the area where Burke told is being held. Burke told tells Jan to tell her family that he brought her on vacation. He made a mistake and took her too far away. He said he did not tell her family like he should have, and this was just a mistake, but she needed to tell her family this. He also tells her he had been visited by Zeta and Zethra, and they told him there were four things that neither of them could talk about. They could not talk about Zeta, Zethra, or the alien planet. They could not talk about the relaxing pills. They could not talk about the mission at all, and they could not talk about the sexual experiences, which were part of this mission. Jan was also to have no contact with any other men, even her father. So she was to avoid all men and boys. If either of them talked about the four things or Jan had contact with other men, some bad things would happen. Jan's sister Karen would go blind. The aliens would kill her father. They would take Susan to complete the mission and then Jan herself would be vaporized. Jan says that she was scared to death, so she followed the rules for years. Now, later it's learned that Burke told had bribed a guard in the Mexican jail in order to get access to Jan. 
Bob and Marianne went to Mazalon, Mexico to get Jan. When they see her, her immediate concern was for Berthold. She wanted him to come home with them. She insisted that her parents contact the authorities and tell them they had just been on a vacation and nothing happened and she was fine. But, of course, her parents aren't going to do this because by this time they realize that, okay, she has been kidnapped and taken to Mexico and he's wanting to marry her. Jan doesn't get this. She's trying to protect Berthold and the mission. When they got on the plane to come home, Jan wouldn't even sit by her father on the plane and was avoiding contact with him. Bob and Marianne got this Mexican marriage certificate and sent it back to Mexico and they requested an annulment. They took Jan for a physical exam. The doctor said her hymen was not broken and there were no signs of sexual abuse. Now, it's a common myth that if someone has sexual contact, their hymen is always broken, but that is not always the case. He was, what Jan says, was gentle with him. So, I mean, it, she was sexually assaulted. They just didn't see the signs of it. It's not an exact thing. Jan tells her family she was not kidnapped and the whole time she was taken up for Berktold. Now, this is clearly signs of Jan being brainwashed. I mean, by Berktold and by the alien story and she's full force believing this. Jan says that after she came home, she constantly had thoughts about how to be with Berktold and how to complete this mission. Now, I want to go back to before the kidnappings. I know this is kind of out of order, but you needed to hear about the kidnapping in order to understand the things that happened before. In late 1972, now this is two years before Jan was kidnapped, Marianne received a phone call from Berktold. He tells Marianne that he's busy at his furniture store and he can't leave for lunch. And, you know, could she bring him a sandwich to eat? And so she did. But this became a regular thing. Berktold would call and Marianne would take him lunch. She said he began to tell her the things that she really needed to hear to make her feel good about herself. He f flattered her. Marianne said she liked this and began to develop feelings for Berktold. She tried to push these feelings away. It was wrong. She was a religious woman. But the feelings were still there and she couldn't resist these feelings. She had been married for 12 or 13 years to Bob, and her marriage was obviously past this stage, this honeymoon stage, and of getting those tingly feelings and constant flattery. One point, the families went to an LDS function in Logan, Utah. Marianne says she and Berktold took a ride through the mountains when things got a little more serious. They began kissing and touching one another, she said it did not result in sexual intercourse, but it was very inappropriate for two married people. She said the relationship gave her this new excitement in her life that a mom needed. Now, what this is going on is the grooming of Marianne. And when we talk about pedophiles and, and child molesters, we hear of grooming, you know, shaping this person into accepting what's going to happen. But parents a lot of times are also groomed and that's what's going on. He wanted to break down Mary Ann's defenses to get to Jan so that Mary Ann would trust him and not see what he was doing. Burke told and Bob, Jan's dad, Bob, like I said, they were friends and they would have private conversations about their lives. Burke told revealed to Bob that his sexual relationship with his wife, Gail was terrible. One day, Berktold was having a particularly bad day and asked Bob to go for a ride with him. They began talking about Berktold's wife, Gail, and how he could no longer stand her or sex with her, and he just needed to have sex and get some relief. The two men began joking about masturbation, and Bob could see that Berktold had become sexually aroused. Burke told, then asked Bob to give him some relief. Now, they played this off like a joke, but Burke told said to Bob, oh, it's just kid stuff, and I really need to get some relief, you understand, as a man. 
So Bob gave the relief to Berktold and sexually gratified him. We don't know the exact circumstances of how this gratification occurred. We just know that he said he did give him the relief. Bob obviously did not tell anybody about this at the time. Now, this again is Berktold grooming Bob to get to Jan. Bob and Marianne were obviously very smitten by Berktold and they were flattered. And they had brought Berktold into their inner circle and they trusted him fully. Now, neither Bob nor Marianne knew of the relationship Berktold was having with the other. So Marianne didn't know about Bob and Berktold and Bob didn't know about Berktold and Marianne. So who is this guy? Berktold is involved in inappropriate sexual contact with Marianne and then he convinces Bob, Marianne's husband, to give him a relief sexually. Who is this guy? We're obviously dealing with somebody who knows how to groom people. This obviously wasn't anything new to him. And in 1974, Berktold was reprimanded by the high council of the LDS church because he had involvement with another young girl and the church counseled him about that. He went to see a psychologist in California to receive treatment for this affliction, as he put it. He came back from California and told Bob about the treatment he was receiving. Berktold said he had sex with his aunt when he was only four and this caused his issues but the psychologist had a treatment plan that would help him. So Berktold blames this strange ideas about sex that he's having with Marianne and Bob and all of them. He blames that on sexual abuse as a child. But that was okay because now this psychologist has a plan that's going to help him. This is how he's explaining it to Bob. So Berktold is telling Bob about this new treatment plan that the psychologist has and he says here's the treatment plan he tells bob that he that being burke told needed to lie next to jan while she was in bed and listen to some pre-recorded audio tapes so in case this is getting confusing burke told tells bob who is jan's father that the way to cure his sexual affliction is for him to lay in bed with this man's daughter and listen to pre-recorded audio tapes. He tells Bob, you can call the doctor yourself and find out that I'm telling you the truth, but that's what I got to do to solve my problem. But Bob tells Burke told that he trusts him and believes him, so he doesn't need to call the doctor for verification. So Bob and Mary Ann begin to allow Burke told to do exactly that. He begins this treatment of lying down with Jan in bed and listening to these tapes. And the way this went is once Jan was in bed and asleep, Burke told would lay down beside her alone, not being monitored by parents or anything, not that that would make it any better, and listens to these tapes that say things such as, feel her caressing you, feel the warmth of the blanket, and other very disturbing things like that. We've got a brief clip of some of those recordings, and we're going to play them for you. Listen for the waves in the background, and she starts caressing you a little faster now, and you can feel it, and it feels so good. It feels so good. She's caressing you very rapidly now, and you can feel it very rapidly. It feels good, and you listen for the waves. You feel the warm, soft blanket, and the blanket smells good. So we've obviously got big time issues going here. You've heard the audio recordings and we've got parents that are allowing this pedophile to lie in bed with their child. The FBI discovered that the psychologist really did exist, but was not a licensed psychologist and had his license revoked. And of course, like it's any real shocker to anybody during this time, the police later discover that Burke told is molesting Jan during all these sessions. He was sleeping in her bed with her with the parents consent about four times a week for six months. And this occurred this. Okay. And this took place all the way up until the day he kidnapped her. 
Bob and Mary Ann said that they had no idea Burke told had sexual fantasies about Jan. And they say that this was a time when pedophile wasn't really a word in most people's vocabularies. They trusted Berthold and did not see the warning signs because of their close relationships and involvements with him. And, and that's what grooming does, is it kind of gets them to put their defenses down. He was always giving her vitamins and allergy pills, but later it's found out, just like in the kidnapping, that these pills were actually sleeping pills. They discovered that this wasn't even the first time he had used this flimsy alien abduction scam uh, on girls. He had actually done this several times before. So surely now, and I know we've kind of skipped back and forth, but we want to get some backstory in there. But now we're back up to Jan being rescued and she's home. Surely Burke told's on his way to prison. Jan's going to get the help that she needs and everything's going to be all right, right? Not so much. After Jan gets home, the FBI tells Bob and Marianne to absolutely have no contact with Burke Told, his wife, the kids, or anyone in that family. And that seems like a common sense thing. But obviously they felt like they needed to verbalize that to them. And with good reason, because on Christmas Eve of that year, it didn't stick. Gail Burke told came to the Broberg home. Mary Ann answered the door and Gail requested to speak with Bob alone. She came into the home and she spoke with Bob by himself. After she left, Bob told Mary Ann that Gail wanted them to sign affidavits and drop the charges against Burke told her husband. Gail said that if they didn't do this, the Berktolds were going to expose Bob's homosexual relationship with Berktold and tell everything. So now we see that this trap has been set. The dad is under this pressure because he's been involved in this sexual encounter with Berktold and the wife's been involved with the sexual encounter with Berktold. I mean, they got a lot of problems going on. Bob and Mary Ann signed these affidavits and they basically absolve Burke told of responsibility. They say that Jan wasn't taken by force or against her will. She wasn't held confined against her will at any time that she was with Burke told. And they, in the affidavit, it even states that they believe there's a strong possibility that Burke told was under the impression that he had their permission and consent to take Jan with him when they left in that October. It also had a statement in there about how it is Bob and Mary Ann's right under the First Amendment of the Constitution to keep these matters within their family, and the interest of justice and society would not be served by continuing to prosecute this matter. So they have signed basically an affidavit that lets Burke told off the hook for kidnapping and molesting their daughter. I can only imagine how the FBI agents who worked on this case felt. They were obviously fuming. They told Bob and Jan that they couldn't do this and that they were still going to take Burke told to trial. But they were aware, as True Crime Out Loud listeners are also aware, when the victim or the victim's parents in this case become uncooperative, it makes the case very, very, very difficult to prosecute because there would be no cooperating witnesses with the case. Burke told's trial was postponed and he was released on his own recognizance. So after all this, his trial gets postponed. He gets let out on bond that released on own recognizance means that he didn't even put up any money. He basically signed his own bond. Berktold ended up moving to Ogden, Utah to work at his brother Joe's car dealership and his wife stayed with in Pocatello with the kids. And this was all while he was awaiting trial on this kidnapping charge. However, Berktold would come back to Pocatello every weekend and still attended church every weekend. And as if the story couldn't get any more convoluted, it really does. Jan said that the first time she has contact with Burke told after she was returned home from the kidnapping, he was in her bedroom. 
The white box and the alien voices woke her up and she saw him standing in her bedroom. The box talked of the mission and how she was to keep following the rules. She said that she would get notes handed to her at school telling her to go to a particular location after school and she would receive further instructions on the payphone at the location. Jan always complied with this and the alien voices talked to her over the phone when she would do this. She got love letters from Burke told and she wrote love letters back to him and Jan stayed strong in her support of Burke told. In fact, she told her mother that she wanted to marry him. This is all while this guy is out on bond for kidnapping and molesting her. Well, while this is going on, after she's home from her kidnapping, about six months later, so spring of 1975, Jan's home, Burke told, begins calling Mary Ann every day. He's telling Marianne how much he loves her, and he used the same flattery and grooming that he had used before. She asks him, well, why would you marry Jan if you love me? And he tells her, well, we need to meet in person so I can explain all this to you. So Marianne agrees, and she goes to his motor home where he was living. She gets there, and he expresses his love for her and told her she needed to leave Bob so they could have this great life together. Now, this day ends with Marianne and Berktold having sex. While he's on bond for abducting and molesting her daughter. Yes. A few days after this encounter, Berktold calls Bob and tells Bob that he had sex with his wife. So the affair between Marianne and Berktold goes full force. Now it's a sexual relationship. Well, Bob, he starts to see through some of it. And he realizes that Berktold's doing this to get to Jan. And it wasn't really about Marianne. He feared for the safety of his kids. So Bob goes to the LDS bishop and gets advice from them. And eventually, Bob files for divorce for Marianne. Bert told calls Bob and tells him you're losing your wife and you're going to lose your kids too. I mean, he's just taunting him. Marianne is devastated that she's been served with divorce papers. But Bert told tells Marianne, get a lawyer and you could easily get custody of your kids because Bob is a homosexual. Now, Marianne didn't believe this because she didn't know about his encounter with her husband. He would keep telling her that Bob didn't want her and that she just needed to get the lawyer and they could be together and raise the family together. Well, Mary Ann goes to an attorney and the attorney tells Mary Ann she needed to get rid of Berktold. He was the issue. This affair that was going on between Mary Ann and Berktold lasted about eight months. And all of this was after Jan comes home. Marianne tells Burke told, I'm not going to leave my husband, and she was done with him. And Marianne and Bob were actually able to reconcile and try to pull their family back together. So nearly two years after Jan was kidnapped, all this has been going on with Burke told and the affair with Marianne, but it's two years after the kidnapping, the case finally comes to court. Burke told takes a plea deal because... The witnesses obviously aren't cooperating and he pleads guilty to kidnapping and he's sentenced to five years in prison. However, it ends up being reduced down to 45 days. Yep, you heard me right. He kidnapped someone, took them to Mexico, married them illegally, a juvenile, molested her, and he got 45 days. That's it. And you would think that that's where this story ends. Guy gets off light 45 days for something that he should sit in prison probably for the rest of his life for. So after court, Burke told moves away to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where he bought a family fun center. And he sounds like the kind of guy that needs to own a family fun center. Yeah. He was still in contact with Jan, and he wanted Jan to come to Jackson Hole and work at his family fun center. Well, like I said, this is two years later, so Jan's 
14 at this time. Jan begs her parents to go to Jackson Hole, and they're not going to allow this, her to go stay with this guy that's kidnapped her. She would constantly argue with Bob and Mary Ann and continue to beg to go to Jackson Hole. Berktold ends up calling Mary Ann, and he tells her that Jan's coming to Jackson Hole one way or another. She's dead set on it, and it's going to happen. She's going to start walking, and she's going to hitchhike to get there if she need to. So it would probably be best for Jan if Bob and Mary Ann just allowed her to, to get there, and so she could get there safely. So Mary Ann puts Jan on a plane to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And this is just, I don't know. I assume we're going to discuss this towards the end. Yeah. But I'm absolutely mind blown by these parents still cooperating with this pedophile that's molested their daughter. Well, Bob was not happy about Marianne doing this. And he said, this is not good. And we're going to regret this happening. Jan stayed there for two weeks. And she lived in Berktold's motorhome with him. And the mission continued. Berktold tells Jan he would be divorcing Gail and they were going to get married. Well, Marianne back at home is having second thoughts about this and she wants Jan to come back home. Berktold was livid. He told Marianne that he would take Jan away and they would never see her again. He was going to take her to the jungles of Africa and just he was angry. And Jan didn't want to go back. She wanted to stay with Berktold. Berktold's brother, Joe, winds up convincing Jan and Berktold that if Jan doesn't go back to Pocatello, it's going to be bad. So Jan goes back. So Jan has returned home from her summer job in Jackson Hole, completing the mission with Berktold. She had been home just a few weeks. One morning, Jan did not join the family for breakfast and so they went to her room and found a letter from her and this letter was discovered on august 10th 1976 when jan was 14 years old the letter said that jan was leaving and she was leaving without burke told this time she said that she couldn't accept their religion and their quote messed up morals because they would not let her be with burke told bob and marianne are obviously extremely upset when they find this letter the next day, Berktold calls Bob and Marianne and told them that he talked to Jan and that Jan had reported to him that she was running away. He tells Bob and Marianne that he's worried about Jan because she never, she never even told him where she was going. Bob and Marianne were unsure about what to do, so they told people that she had gone to her grandmother's house. Bob and Marianne did finally call the police two weeks after Jan left. Like we said, this is Jan's 14, and she's now missing for two weeks. And finally, Bob and Marianne involved the police again. Three weeks after she left, Burke told had to report to serve the 45-day jail sentence that he got for the kidna the first kidnapping. But he only served 10 days of the 45-day jail sentence when he was released for good behavior. When he was released, Burke told moved away in the motorhome and no one was real sure where he was. Burke told would continue to call Bob and Mary Ann and he would tell them that he had spoken to Jan on occasion, but he didn't know her location. He told them that he was concerned about Jan and that he believed she had been stealing, selling drugs, using drugs and prostituting herself in order to survive. He also tells Mary Ann about his love for Jan and how he feels like she is basically his soulmate and he wants to be with her. After about three months, Jan calls home. And we actually heard some audio of that. We didn't include it for length purposes here. But you can actually look it up and listen to it. And, and she basically says that she wants to let them know that she loves them and she misses them. And she still wants to marry Berktold and she's okay. The FBI traces Burke Toll's phone calls to Bob and Marianne to Salt Lake City, Utah, but they don't know exactly where in Salt Lake City, so they're searching trailer parks and motorhomes looking for Burke Toll's motorhome. They're finally able to locate him, 
but they don't let him know that they're there. They surveil him for a few weeks looking for Jan because the FBI obviously believes that Jan has run away to be with Berktold again. But they watch him and they don't see her ever. And after a couple of weeks of this, they make contact with Berktold and he tells them, no, I don't know where she is. But they did notice that he had almost like a shrine set up to her inside the motorhome. Poster size photos of Jan. They continue to do surveillance on Berktold and they see him use a payphone. They go to the phone after Berktold left and they see that he's left a phone book open and there was a phone number written in it. The phone number was to Flint Ridge Sacred Heart Academy Catholic Girls School in Flint Ridge, California. Law enforcement contacts the school and the school says, hey, we've never heard of Jan Broberg. We don't know who that is. Law enforcement doesn't give up that easy. And they pry and pry and convince them that they're looking for a 14-year-old girl and the circumstances surrounding that girl. And the school finally says, hey, we've, we've got a student named Jan Tobler that, that may in reality be Jan Broberg. And in fact, Jan Tobler was Jan Broberg. So once again... Jan is rescued, this time from the Flint Ridge Sacred Heart Academy Catholic Girls School in Flint Ridge, California. She's rescued, and again, she's not real happy about it. She's brought back home, and she isolates herself from her family, basically spending all of her time in her bedroom. So what led up to Jan leaving, running away, and how did she get to Flint Ridge Girls School? On August 10th, the day that the note was found, she had left through her bedroom window. Berktold was outside and waiting on her, where they drove to California. He enrolls her in this girl's school, presenting himself as her father. He tells the nuns at the school that he's a CIA agent and he had escaped from Lebanon, where Jan's mother was killed. He tells the nuns if people call looking for Jan or for him... These were the people that are after him. These are the bad guys and don't provide any information to anybody about my daughter. I mean, I need y'all to take care of her while I take care of my CIA business. Burke told would drive every weekend to visit Jan while she was in school. Now, the day after Jan is found at the girls school, Burke told is arrested for federal probation violation and impersonating a federal agent. And he's brought back to Pocatello, Idaho. A little over a month after Berthold is arrested this time, Bob's floral business burns to the ground. And he just knew that Berthold had to have had something to do with this. Jan, on the other hand, feels that this fire happened because of what she had done wrong. And the aliens were angry at her. Well, police find the two men who burned the business. They had met Burke Told in jail, and he offered them a monthly stipend of $1,000 if they would burn the business. However, they weren't able to make a strong enough case to connect Burke Told to these two people from jail in order to get a conviction on him. So he skates on this charge. So this is even tiring to keep updating, and I know that you may have a hard time following it, but just a little brief recap. This guy has now been in sexual encounters with both parents. He's abducted the girl twice. He's been involved in sexual encounters with her several times. She spent a summer working at Jackson Hole at his family fun center with her parents' permission, essentially, being molested then. And now we're in court again after he has registered him, her in a school under a false name and told them that he's a CIA agent. The second kidnapping case finally comes to court. And Burke told is acquitted by reason of mental defect on all charges, and he is sentenced to serve time in a mental health facility in 1977. He does, in fact, spend time there six months, and then he's released. Burke told says that he had his this fixation on Jan because of his childhood and that he had grown up in isolation on a farm in Wyoming, but he was never really part of his family. 
He said that he was forced to sleep in the bunkhouse and had been sexually abused by the hired help. He stated that his mom got sick and she left home and he had to take care of his younger sister. When he took care of his sister, he now felt like he was part of the family. And that kind of reflects back to what Joe said, his brother, that he recalled Burke told sexually abusing their younger sister. This forced situation of taking care of his sister to be included in the family made him feel this need to take care of a little girl. That's what he's claiming. After the second kidnapping, Burke told didn't contact Jan as much. She said she now knows he was losing interest in her because she was becoming older. But she still believed in the mission and even continued to follow those lists of things that she wasn't supposed to do. On her 16th birthday, she said she knew she had not completed the mission and that they were going to take Susan. So her plan was to get a gun, kill Susan, and then kill herself. And obviously she didn't follow through with this. And that's just tragic. I mean, you can tell that this... This little girl has bought this story hook, line, and sinker. It was not until the day after she turned 16 when she wasn't pregnant and therefore didn't complete the mission that she finds out that absolutely nothing bad happened. Her sister didn't become blind, her father wasn't dead, and she didn't vaporize. She told her best friend and her sister about the mission, and they urged her to go to her parents because... They could tell she truly believed these things. So Jan told her parents and they responded with disbelief, but they were very concerned. And it took Jan some time actually to realize that she was not part alien and no bad things would happen because of her and that kind of thing. He really had this hold on her. Brainwashing. Yeah, definitely brainwashing. And Jan continued to recall things as she gets older, you know, more and more pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall into place. And Jan remembers doing sleepovers at the Berktold home. She said they had a large trampoline. They'd all sleep outside under the stars. And on one of these sleepovers, Jan remembers waking up with her panties down around her ankles and Berktold was there next to her. He tells her that she was sleeping restlessly, tossing and turning, and that must have gotten her panties down somehow. And Jan, who would have been 12, 11 or 12 at this time, believed him, believed that's what happened. In June of 1973, Jan went with the Berktold family on a vacation to Seattle. One night at dinner, Burke told said Jan began to act strange. She was swaying and rocking back and forth and basically acting odd, and Burke told decided to take her back to the room. Jan said that she remembered being very tired and Burke told carrying her back to the room and she woke up at one point during that encounter and saw Burke told naked. So she's remembering all of these instances that that happen the older she gets. And he's obviously drugging her a good bit in order to make these things happen and her not remember it. So essentially between 1972 and 1976, I mean, he's having repeated encounters of all types with basically the whole family, but all in an attempt to get close to Jan. So then comes the book. How this book comes to be, Marianne, in the 90s, she began to write it based on the events that happened in the case, and she had the help of Jan. In 2003, she completed the book, and it was named Stolen Innocence, and it gets released. Marianne and Jan began doing book signings, and they were doing speaking engagements, and what they were doing is bringing awareness to child predators and how the majority of the time it's not, like I said, not the scary guy driving the van down the street handing out candy, but it's someone you trust. It's someone in your inner circle. However, this brings Burke told back into their lives and he fought them tooth and nail. He began to put out information that these were lies and they were just trying to sell a book and they were trying to tarnish him. He tells them that he's going to make their lives miserable. So this results in Jan filing a restraining order against Berktold. But Berktold contested the restraining order. So they end up 
with her as an adult, him as an older man, face to face in court. Burke told question Jan directly, but like I said, now she's a grown woman who knew Burke told was an abuser. And if you see any of the case and watch this documentary, Jan held her own very well. The judge granted this order, and this was to be in place not for the standard three years, but for the remainder of Burke Told's life. He was to have absolutely no contact with Jan. But Jan was still afraid of Burke Told. She and her mother continued to do these speaking engagements, but were looking out for him because they knew how he was. They're at one of these engagements, these events, and Jan has made some allies along the way. And one of those being the Bikers Against Child Abuse. So they're showing up to this event to protect Jan in case Berktold shows up. We're never going to guess what happens, but Berktold is in the parking lot. And he gets stopped and held by the bikers until the police get there. The police search Berktold's van and they find a gun and he's arrested again. This time he's charged with certain persons forbidden to possess a firearm and aggravated assault and he was found guilty on these charges. By this time, Burke told had already divorced Gail. He had remarried a teacher and she had two daughters, both of who they find out later had run away from home because they were being abused by Burke told. In 2005, now remember the book came out in 2003, so these events are going on. So we're in 2005, before Berktold gets his sentence in court, he took an overdose of his heart medication with alcohol and kills himself. So Berktold is finally dead in 2005. And to tie up some of the other loose ends in the story, in 1999, Bob sells his floristry business and they move to St. George, Utah. And in 2018, Bob Broberg dies at the age of 80, but he and Marianne were still together and still married. Jan went on to get married and have a child and she has worked as an actress and now goes by the name Jan Broberg Felt. Her sister Karen became a math teacher and her sister Susan became an attorney. Mary Ann, her mom, as a result of this, went back to school and became a social worker, and she went before Congress and lobbied for the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and she was able to secure funding both in the state of Idaho and Utah for that organization. After the release of their book, Stolen Innocence, Jan was contacted by six other women who claimed to have been victims of Berktold. She learned that one of these victims had sent Berktold to prison for rape of a child, and served a year for that incident. Jan said that Berktold also played the alien tapes for this victim. She completely defends her parents and said their upbringing and faith in their church made them blind to the signs. They believed in the good in people and also believed in forgiveness. That's kind of where the story is for now. They've talked about doing a sequel to The Abducted in Plain Sight because there was extra footage. So, I mean, look out for that. You're going to want to watch this. But I, I wanted people to hear this story because child predators are very, very manipulative. And they're very good at the game they play. I said it earlier, but most predators are already in that circle of trust of a child that they're going to abuse or have abused. Berktold himself worked on this family. We saw it for several years before he actually abused Jan. He manipulated and groomed Marianne, Bob, Jan, and even the other children in the family into trusting him and loving him. And people like Berktold are very believable and seem like very good people. And when we find out that this person has molested a child, it's like, oh my gosh, not, not them. They're such a good person. But we don't know what's going on within somebody. Mary Ann, Jan's mom, said that she felt responsible for bringing Berktold into their lives. And had it not been for her, Jan would not have been abused 
And she said in this documentary, she just cannot forgive herself. Bob did not talk extensively about his relationship with Burke Told, other than it was the one incident in the car. So that's all that we know of. But being members of the LDS church, this being in the 70s, one incident would have been extremely significant in his life. So what are your thoughts about it? On True Crime Out Loud, our goal is to present the facts. And I feel like we've done that. And then for us to kind of weigh in based on on what we think about the case. And while I respect Jan's stance towards her parents, I just I just can't let it go unsaid that I feel like they have major, major responsibility in this whole thing. You look back at some of these and you know, I know all I know all of the defenses that are put up. Well it's the 70s. Okay. I get it. Um, the 70s were a much more, I guess, naive time. I, I hate to say naive time. but Well, were, the FBI, that's how they described Bob and Marianne as very naive. Well, very naive for sure. And I think a lot of that does have to do generationally. But I do realize that the 70s were a different time. And, and the FBI, as you said, described them as naive. But there is just no way that something like this should happen. I mean, where these parents are letting this guy, you know, he comes up with some story about how he needs to lay in bed with her and all this. I, 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 but I think it's hard for you and I to look at this situation and not say, dear Lord, what were y'all doing? But that's because of our law enforcement backgrounds. We don't trust people naturally like most people do. I completely and, disagree with you on that, though, because no one... No one, law enforcement background or not, trusts people with their kids to this level. You don't have to have a law enforcement background or anything other than good old-fashioned common sense to know that you need to distance yourself away from some guy who tells you that his treatment for sex addiction is getting in bed with your kid. Well, I mean, it happens all the time under parents' noses, and they, they don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm trying not to be judgmental of Bob and Marianne because I was not in their shoes. I don't have the same. We don't have the same life experiences. And, and that goes to play in this. So I'm trying not to, to make a judgment on what they did. Yeah. And they admitted, yeah, we made mistakes and we screwed up. But you can't go back and undo that now. Well, and I understand that. And that that's certainly true. But I and I hate to. I hate to go so far as to describe their behavior, but as criminal, I mean, it's not criminal, but I, I will tell you, I mean, their behavior to me seems negligent, negligent to the point that, that a, a normal person would question their ability to effectively raise their children. If you are so naive that you are so susceptible to this kind of thing and not just the first time that she's abducted, even though we know that there were already things going on. So at the time that she's taken on the horseback riding trip, the first abduction, she has already spent with parental consent four nights a week for six months in the bed with this adult. And again, we're talking about a different time, the 1970s. There is no way that law enforcement involved in this case today would not be referring her parents to DHR and other social services. There is, in reality, this kind of thing probably wouldn't happen today because these, this girl would not be returned to her parents. I have serious questions about whether they're capable of raising th their kids. I, I mean, I would agree with that. If this were to happen in, in the 2000s, she would not have been returned to the parents because you're, you're right. You're right. There's some negligence there. But again, like I said, I'm trying not to, to be judgmental because of life experiences and different time and their, their faith in the LDS church and everything that was going on. It's hard for me to look at it from that perspective. And like I said, we're, we're law enforcement, so we don't trust people. Well, And, that, and, and it's hard to see the opposite end of the spectrum where somebody who's just naturally trust everybody until they break that trust 
we're on the opposite end. So it's hard for me to put myself in that position. You're trying to see the good in these people when it's hard to do it. Because let me tell you, there are plenty of people out there, probably some listening to this podcast, that are members of the LDS church that would say, hey, being a member of our church, I mean, we would never allow our kid to, to engage in this. I mean, so I think the idea that they're in a very structured, very religious, that they're very structured, very religious, and that they are heavily involved in their church, a church of any kind, I think that has very little bearing on their parental decisions. Well, no, and I don't want to seem like I'm saying because of their faith. Because of their faith, and again, we covered it's very family-oriented, it's very church-oriented, and you, you trust those people, and you're connected to those people in your church. I think that went into play with how much they trusted this guy, is is what I was getting at with that. And then the fact that Bob has this sexual contact with Berktold and Marianne's having an affair, and how it would look to their church community, which is part of their extended family. Well, and I think we could bat this one back and forth uh, several times, and, and I don't, I don't want to do that because I don't. The listeners out there don't want to hear us argue with each other. But my contention would be that even with the nature of the relationship between Bob and Marianne and Berktold, the minute Berktold says, "Hey, you're going to absolve me of responsibility for kidnapping your daughter, or I'm going to tell everybody that you gave me relief in the car." Well, hey, Bob's. it's time for Bob to champ up and admit what he did wrong. At that point, he willfully exposes his daughter to more potential danger in what appears to me to be an effort to save himself and his family name. And that ain't real religious -y. Is religious -y even a word? Probably not, but it's not religious -y. Okay, I think we'll end it here because you're right. We could go all day long back and forth. Don't forget the Netflix documentary is Abducted in Plain Sight, directed by Sky Borgman, and it's produced by Top Knot Films. It's an hour and a half long, well worth the watch. Sometimes I feel like my life might get a little bit crazy and things going on, but when you watch this documentary and you hear these people telling their story, it brings you back to say, hey, you know what, things aren't that bad for me. The book written by Mary Ann and co-authored by Jan is called Stolen Innocence. There's also links on our website to some other sources and some other information on child abuse and seeing the red flags and the warning signs. Hope you enjoyed the case this week. It certainly should appeal to those who like twists and turns. As always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.